Hi, I'm Kezia, a stroke survivor and a member of BIND. And hi, I'm Carrie, a stroke survivor and a member of BIND as well. And today we're happy to welcome Brandon Higgs. He is a U.S. Army combat veteran. After active duty, he decided to go back to school and he received his Bachelor of Science in Health Services and a Master of Science in Occupational Therapy. Brandon is the owner of h and Driver Rehabilitation Specialist, LLC, which is a driver rehabilitation program that focuses on the road for the neurologically impaired here in North Texas. So welcome very much, Brandon. And just so our listeners can get a little bit to know you, tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah, thanks, Carrie, for the introduction. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Yeah, um, so I was in the Army, uh, and I went back to school for occupational therapy. Uh, while I was in school, I got exposed to driver rehab at Vanderbilt University uh, during one of my uh, internships, so to speak. So I did that for about three months at Vanderbilt. Absolutely loved driver rehab, helping folks kind of get back to driving if they have the ability. Uh, and then I was offered a job right out of school from a private practice doing driver rehab. Excuse me. And so I did that for a time. Uh, an opportunity presented itself here in Dallas. Uh, at Baylor, and uh, so I started a driver rehab program in Frisco, and did that for a couple years, Uh, and during that time, um, you know, I thought I wanted to start my own business, so I started my own company about two years ago, me and a guy from grad school, and we're certified driver rehabilitation specialists at CDRS, Uh, that's accredited through a program, I mean, I'm sorry, association called AIDID, which is the Association for Driver Rehab Specialists. So A-D-E-D, and their acronym doesn't quite work out because, it, yeah, um, but it's the Association for Driver Rehabilitation Specialists, AIDID, and they have a search engine. You can look up CDRSs in your area, and there's also various levels of you could be a driver rehab professional, you could specialize in wheelchairs, you could specialize in the elderly, you could specialize you know, in young adults with autism and so on and so forth. So we're becoming more, you know, um, they're, they're, they're coming up with different titles uh, that you can be rather than just be a CDRS, but that's what we do. Okay, cool. Yeah, I think, and right now that you're telling us a lot of different kinds of um I I guess kind of levels are kind of needed of help to get back into driving. Mm -hmm. I think one of the first to sit or one of the first questions that we get uh, asked a lot is like, who decides like when someone is ready to drive in whatever level. And and obviously we're with brain injury survivors. So like for a brain injury survivor, who makes that decision? Like, Ooh, they should take this class and get ready to drive again. Well, really that's, that is very, that's a, a collaborative process depending on, the severity of your injury, um, it, it, you know, a lot of times those decisions, if it's, you know, a significant brain injury and you and the recovery process has been long and there still are some lingering uh, cognitive deficits or some physical mm-hmm. deficits, uh, a lot of times the occupational therapist is the one that identifies that. You know, uh, I'm not saying that's the way it always goes, but it's, it's usually the rehab therapist, the speech therapist, the physical therapist, Um, you know, but it could be the neurologist. It could be, um, you know, it could be a family member. It it just, it just just depends. Now, that's going to send me into what does Texas say about returning the driver? Do you want to go ahead and get into that? Um, Yeah, all the information. Okay. (laughs) So this is... There's not a law that says that you have to go through my program or retake the road test at DPS. And the DPS is the Department of Public mm-hmm. Safety. They're the ones that uh, administer the driver's license here in the state of Texas. Every state is a little different. So they have a medical advisory board. Every state has a medical advisory board. They're independent from the Department of Public Safety. So we call them the MAB. <clears throat> Excuse me. And you can look any of this stuff up online. It's all public information. So the medical advisory board has a document called a guide for determining driver limitations. That's the name of the document. It's a PDF. You could Google it right now on your phone, a guide for determining driver limitations. And in that document, they have multiple different diagnoses. And when it talks about brain injury, they recommend that ultimately you retake the road test at DPS. 
you know, or that you're seen by somebody like me, and they call it adaptive driving. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, that it really, it's, it's a gray area, unfortunately, but I, it's my belief that in the other CDRSs in the area, we have these ongoing conversations, that that's the best way to cover yourself from a liability mm-hmm. standpoint. Because right. if you get in a wreck, Lord forbid, and hurt somebody or kill somebody, you know, these, these documents are out here, out there. Um, there's different forms, too, that we want the doctors to fill out. Um, so getting back to your question, uh, you know, it, it depends. Yeah. It really depends. If you're in a comprehensive day neuro program, uh, do we all know what those are? Mm-hmm. Yeah, you guys, of course, are familiar. Uh, a lot of times, you know, because when I worked at Baylor, uh, not everybody had to have a driving evaluation by me. Right. Some people yeah. were, the, the therapists, like, they're scoring in the normal ranges. They're progressing. They're managing their finances. They're managing. To me, that's a big indicator. Right. Are you back to doing those, in occupational therapy, we call those instrumental activities of daily living, IADLs. Uh, are you back to doing those things? Are, you know, you might not be back to 100% of your prior level of function, but are you independent? Do you still need help with those those uh, instrumental activities of daily living? Sure. Now, if you need help with basic activities of daily living, like dressing, grooming, now, you know, that's another conversation. You're not appropriate probably for our program just yet. Um, but if you're, you're getting back on your feet, you're managing your own finances, you're, you know, and you're about to return to work, uh, you know, I still think you should schedule an appointment with DPS. Mm, and yeah. there's a special way to do that, and I can keep talking about all that if you want me to. Uh, sure. I mean, okay. I mean, I don't know because I, I went back through the DPS, but I didn't fill out any form. I just did it on my own because right. I wanted yeah. to to make sure I was covered. And that's good, and that's great, and, and I think that's the way to do it. You know, uh, it's a hassle dealing with DPS. <laughs> oh, so, it is. It's a nightmare. Yeah, and <laughs> if, if people want to call our company, we'll we'll guide them through that process okay. for no charge. You know. Uh, if you go to the drive, if you go to dps.gov, I think it's dps.texas.gov, and then you go to driver's license, and then you go to assistance for people with disabilities. Mm. That's what you need to go to. And it's immediately going to take you to a screen where you fill out these form, where you fill out like uh, fillable sections, mm-hmm. your driver's license number, your address, uh, what's your quote unquote disability. You know, you just put, you know, brain injury. I want to take the road test to prove I'm safe. And then you put the driver's license office that's closest to you. Mm-hmm. So what, excuse me, sorry. So what should happen in that event is they'll call you within 48 hours. And they'll say, hey, uh, I see that you filled out these forms. What's going on? And then you just tell them, hey, look, I had a brain change. That's all you got to say. I had a brain change. Uh, I want to reveal that to DPS to cover myself from a liability standpoint. And I want to schedule the road test. Now, what might happen they might make you take the written test too, just so you know. Yeah, yeah. Now there's tests online that you can study for that. I don't um, have to do that, thankfully. Right now, because <laughs> when you walk in a DPS, so let me just slow down because sometimes I get ahead of myself here. Okay, uh, we all do that. We all yeah, do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's okay. Um, so you're going to fill out those forms on DPS.gov. They're going to call you from whatever office, and they're going to ask you what your availability is. You're going to come in with your documents. You know, uh, now if you haven't been to the driver's license office in a while, uh, they've updated all the IDs and you got to come in with like your birth certificate, you know, and a couple pieces of mail. It's all there on the website. It's all there on the website. Yeah. Um, I also recommend you fill out the driver's license application and fill that out before you even come in. Don't sign that until you come in. You know, once again, call mm-hmm. us. This is a lot of information. But just so you know, when you get there, the people that are... Uh, they're, I, I guess you would say, evaluating you. Mm-hmm. They're not medical people. Right, right. They're just, they're DPS workers. Uh, sometimes they'll have a manager that kind of specializes in, they call them comprehensive road test. Essentially, it's the same road test that a 16-year-old takes when they take sure. their driver's license. Yeah. Um, but when you get there, they're looking at you, and if you're walking with a cane or a limp, Mm-hmm. Or you have a speech impediment like aphasia, they may ask you to take the written test. Okay. And that that's kind of how they're doing that right now. Uh, so be prepared for that. 
Sure. Okay. Uh, now, if you have apraxia uh, or you have like receptive aphasia, that might be very difficult. And we've had folks like that. We've, we've, we've had people like that. That's where you really need to reach out to me or somebody like me. You don't have to. You can do whatever you want, of course. <laughs> you know, I mean, I want to make that clear. You know, people, I mean, we're in Texas. People are going to, some people just do whatever they want. That's fine. Um, just realizing you're accepting that liability. But you can call us. And in some of these areas, we can call the managers and just say, hey, we got, we got this person coming in. You know, it, can you make any accommodations? And so there are accommodations that can be made for speech impediments and apraxia. Um, but... You know, it's case by case. Okay. When you keep saying, you know, we're in Texas, we can do whatever we want. That's another question. I have. Um, when you have a brain injury, no, like nobody calls the DPS and says, oh, this person had a brain injury, check mark, you know, black mark right. on you. You can't drive anymore. You know, no one does that, right? I mean. Well, your physician can, you know, or if somebody sees you doing something unsafe, anybody can report to the medical advisory board. Okay. Anybody, if I see somebody driving unsafe, I can get their license plate and and say, hey, I saw this person doing something unsafe, <clears throat> and then make that report to the medical advisory board. Yeah, and I think that's one of the questions, um, and I think from like a, I guess more like personal stand, for, like a experience, um, one of my cousins in a different state, so obviously it's different because we're in Texas, had his um, license withdrawn because he has seizures. Mm -hmm. Can that be done here in Texas as well? Like, or what happens? Can that be possible to get your license withdrawn because of your medical? It can be medically suspended or revoked. Oh, okay. uh, but everything has to go through the medical advisory board. Mm, okay. And I highly recommend maybe you reach out to them and maybe get somebody from the medical advisory board on the podcast. That'd be awesome. Yeah, that's a good idea. Uh, they're updating a lot of stuff now. You can sit in on their open forms. Okay. So when they meet, their meet their meeting is like Zoom. I think it's on Zoom. And uh, you can be on there. And you can, now they go through their business meeting. Mm -hmm. and, you know, a lot of it's very boring. <laughs> but you can ask them, hey, I'd like to talk or ask a question at the end. And I've done that. Uh, because I want to know what's going on. Um, but so the way, the way it goes to get back to your question is, uh, it has to go through the medical advisory board. Okay. So I can make a report or the doctor can make a, a, a referral saying, Hey, look, this person is having multiple seizures. They're still driving. I've asked them not to drive. I recommend they stop driving. And so that's sent to, that's sent to Austin is where the medical advisory board's headquarters is at. Um, and then the doctors review it. They meet once a month, uh, and they could send a packet to that to that driver. They'd send a packet, and it essentially would you know have uh, it's a big thick packet. You can download that offline too. You can see exactly what they're sending these people. Oh, okay. uh, and I used to see them at Baylor all the time, and it just has like a place for the neurologist. You know, what's their condition? What medications are they taking? Are the seizures controlled? Uh, when, when was their last seizure? You know, they're going to ask, mm -hmm. they're going to do their investigation and then you're going to essentially go before a board, uh, and they're going to make a decision on that evidence. Okay. Um, yeah. and that's how your license gets medically suspended. Yeah. And I, I really like how thorough you have been explaining the process. Mm -hmm. Um, I hope that everyone has learned written down their, their mm -hmm. notebook and written down all the uh, all the steps that are needed, but also that they're available online. I, I really think that's really helpful. Mm -hmm. um, is there also like some additional steps that need to be provided for drivers, like in case they expire, like somewhere in between the brain injury and after? And again, right. I think because I'm currently going through that situation. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so as much as I learn, I hope all of our listeners learn too. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so if you can renew it within two years, so if two years has not expired, you can do it online. Okay. Uh, of course, unless it's that time for you to come in person. So you can renew it. Now, if it's outside of two years, um, and I'm, I think I'm right about this. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not 100% sure, about 99% sure, um, about 99.5% sure that uh, if it's outside of two years, then you have to get a permit again. Yeah. That's where I'm and at. And if you have to get a permit, that's fine. You can, you know, um, you can either just go in and take the test if you want to, or you can go through one of the driving schools and take the test. 
uh, if you feel like, hey, look, I need to. And I'll be honest with you, that's a, yeah, I mean, that's a gray area as well. I mean, that's what we've done. I had a gentleman that had, um, he had a stroke, and he ended up having a uh, heart transplant, uh, and he had, he had aphasia. He had aphasia and apraxia. And, uh, I mean, it was, it was pretty significant. It was pretty significant. Uh, but he could drive. He could drive great. You know, and, and yeah. so we're working with him. Uh, and uh, what we ended up doing, because his license was, was expired, you know, he had very he had a very complicated course um, where he had a heart transplant in, during this course. Um, so his license was, was expired. So what we ended up doing was he went through an online course, online, and he took the permit course there, mm-hmm. and he took the test. And so, you know, he took the test. He got a certificate. He went to DPS. Uh, and then when it was time for him to get his license, you know, he got his license. Yeah. And, of course, with aphasia, and I know that was one of your questions, mm-hmm. you can get that communication impediment on your driver's license. So if you get pulled over by a peace officer, they know, hey, I'm not drunk or on drugs. Right. Or trying to play some funny business, I have a neurological impairment sure. that affects my speech. Oh, okay. I, th- I think that's really helpful to understand that part because I also was, right now you were also saying, um, about accommodations and like, what are some accommodations? Like if it was speech, like, you know, I have aphasia, but thankfully this podcast is making me feel better <laughs> and working on it. But, um, how do you, what are some accommodations for, um, things like aphasia or if you have some, um, mobility issues, like what are some accommodations for the driving at DPS at DPS? Yeah. Uh, well, it's case by case basis. So I've talked to several managers, and I haven't seen any of this in writing, by the way. Um, it's very subjective, you yeah. know. But hey, uh, they it's it's they say that they can, you know, for a, like apraxia, they can, you know, put the it can play through the headphones. I don't know how more helpful that is than not. Um, but aphasia, I mean, basically. You know, however that individual communicates, and a lot of times they have a family member, and I, you know, most of the time what I've seen, they're not using their communication device if they were issued one. Mm-hmm. I don't know what y'all have seen, um, but it's just kind of they get their point across, and then really I'm there in the office, kind of advocating for them, or a family member is, uh, and I haven't had any problems. Yeah, I haven't had any problems, and they know why we're coming. Because we went through the assistance for people with disabilities. Sure. We didn't just schedule a road test and show up. You know, they know why we're there. And one more thing. If you take these tests, you know, when you get the DPS, you got to make sure that they're, that they are indicating that you've taken that it's a special test and it's a, there's a pink sheet, the pink, uh, it's a pink testing sheet. Anyways, you, you, if that has to be filled out. And so a lot of times I get the DPS and they don't even know that. The, the person, because they don't do it that much. You know, and I say, hey, I think it's supposed to be a pink sheet. You know, I don't even know what that means. I know, I just know that it's a pink sheet. <laughs> yeah, there you go. That's good. Okay, well, I'm going to take a quick little break and just remind our listeners to go ahead and click that like button, that share button, and the follow button if you're on, and notify if you're on YouTube. But yeah, so now we're going to get back to Brandon and get back to more talking about driving. So I do know that a lot of, like for me, I didn't do all those things. I just went in and said, I wanted to drive. I mean, I took I took precautions on my own. I hired a driving instructor and drove for a couple of weeks, you know, did some driving. Because I had um, pretty severe left neglect after my stroke. but And I waited like two years to make sure I was comfortable that I could see. Because, like, I can see Kezia right now. After my stroke, I didn't, Kezia didn't exist in my world. Right. So I, I was scared I would hit the curb. On the left side. So I drove again. And then when I went to the DPS, I remember the lady that did my test, she asked if I wanted, and I don't know the correct term, but I'm pretty sure she called it a suicide knob on the mm-hmm. steering wheel. And I was like, no, I don't think I need that. I'm good with, you know, because my left arm doesn't work, you know. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. fortunately, my right foot's good, so I don't need any pedal adjustments, which I know that is a car modification you can get. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's interesting that there's all these things that you're saying that, but again, that was 15 years ago, so well, things could have changed. I mean, and, and, you know, a conversation argument can be made that you don't have to do any of the stuff that I just said. True. It's all from a liability standpoint. You know, that's what the medical advisor board is. That's what they recommend. The peace officers don't know this. The doctors mostly don't know this. Sure. Um, 
I mean, now, will the lawyer know this? Right. When you run somebody over in Kroger parking lot. Sure. Yeah. That's my whole thing. That's, yeah. You, and you that's, know, so you're just covering yourself. Um, you're just, you're just covering yourself from a liability standpoint. Right. Well, and I do you know, like, they put a designation on my license to put a T for automatic transmission only. Right. Because obviously with my left leg and my left arm not working, I can't push a clutch in and that was do smart, the gear shift. So yeah. if I get pulled over, my license proves that I have gone back through the DPS just by that designation. Well, yeah, I think so. I, I mean, hopefully it's documented somewhere. Hopefully. Yeah. Um, yeah, and, and adaptive equipment, we do we do have that as well. Actually, that's why I'm glad I brought this in. Oh, perfect. We call them spinner knobs or okay. steering orthotics if we want to get real. Sure. You know, technical. But this is a this is a steering orthotic, and this has your secondary controls embedded in it. Oh, okay. So you can have this mounted to the steering wheel, and it's got your turn signals, windshield wipers, horn, brights, lights, uh, and then these other two, you can make them whatever you want. Oh, Where would that be? So that's mounted on the steering wheel. Oh. Like, like you said, those. Like on the right hand side. Yeah. Or yep. So more on the right hand side, and you just have it here, and then you just hit your turn signals. You know, you don't have to bring your hand off and cross over and do something like that. Um, but there's there's various modifications that can be made. Um, and that's, we make those recommendations. Okay. You know, that starts with a comprehensive driving evaluation done by us or somebody like us. Yeah. And then we, we recommend that equipment, then train on that equipment. And then, like you said, uh, retake that road test and get your driver's license updated. Mm -hmm. Yours has a T restriction. If you drove with something like this, it would you would have a P restriction, and that's just applicable devices. Oh, okay. What is that? What a P restriction means? Yes. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. A P restriction is applicable devices, and a lot of times, like you said, they'll have like automatic transmission and power steering, and and, and there's other sure. restrictions as well. Awesome. And I know I had a friend that I don't know how that worked. His Right, right leg was affected, so he had the pedals, the right pedal covered up, and another pedal put in. So yeah, we call that a left foot accelerator. Okay. Um, and left foot accelerators, they seem pretty simple, but that is a very, uh, that could be a very dangerous piece of equipment. Uh, so we absolutely recommend that you go through a reputable, you know, driving rehab program, to do and that. you go through a reputable dealer. Because I just had a lady a couple weeks ago. She bought one off Amazon and on eBay. Please don't do that, okay? Because you're modifying you're modifying a primary control of your vehicle. Mm -hmm. You're modifying the brake and the gas. That's very serious to be doing that. So we recommend you go through a reputable dealership and a reputable installer. Um, and this is what happened. She took it to a mechanic shop, and the mechanic got in and was playing around with that little facilitator and drove it through the bay and totaled the car. Oh, wow. And that happens all the time. Oh, wow. So left foot accelerators can be very beneficial if you're right side hemiparetic, obviously. But, uh, you know, there is some training usually associated with that. And uh, people learn these equipment on different, spe it's a spectrum. Yeah. Some people pick it up very quick. Some people, depending on the severity of the injury sure. or where the injury is in the brain, you know, it can all it can all depend. But it's not as simple as saying, okay, I'm hemiparetic on the right side. I'm going to get a left side accelerator and drive off into the sunset. Sure. It could be very dangerous. And Absolutely. it has been. Yeah, I can see that. I, and people have, I mean, I can go on and on and on about that. Well, yeah. and we're, we're going to take a little break. We're going to okay. have you come back and talk to us some more because we need to go ahead and wrap up this episode before our cameras die on us. Um, but we really appreciate you being here. And we're learning so much and we have so many more questions that we have to go so we're excited that we're going to have you back for another episode so we want to thank you for joining us we want to thank all our listeners for listening and don't forget again to hit the like button the share button the subscribe button like i tell you all the time just click all the buttons that are good that'll keep us going so and then you'll be able to see us on all epi on any platforms on thursday so until next time until next time we hope you've enjoyed listening to Bind Waves and continue to support Bind and our nonprofit mission. We support brain injury survivors as they reconnect into the life, the community, and their workplace. And we couldn't do that without great listeners like you. We appreciate each and every one of you. Continue watching. Until next time. Until next time.